Welcome to Kansas History, a Journal of the Central Plains podcast, a collaborative project of the Kansas Historical Foundation and the Department of History at Kansas State University. I am your host, Lisa Caitlin Highsmith, and today I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Bell, who will be discussing her article, A Congress of Women, the Women's Council at the Ottawa Chautauqua, 1892-1914. to Dr. Sarah Bell graduated with a master's in museum studies in 2012 and finished her PhD in May 2019, both from the University of Kansas. Her dissertation analyzed the intersection of women's political activities with the Chautauqua movement at assemblies in Kansas and Colorado between 1874 and 1919. Sarah has had the opportunity to bring her dissertation research to the public in different ways. In 2018, Sarah joined the Humanities Kansas Speakers Bureau and has enjoyed presenting to audiences across Kansas. She has also published an article in Kansas History in spring 2019 that focused on the Ottawa Chautauqua, which we will be discussing today. Sarah currently works at the Watkins Museum of History located in Lawrence, Kansas as the Development Officer. Hello, Dr. Bell. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So, Dr. Bell, what drew you to this research? A lot of people have asked me the question of, you know, how I found out about Chautauqua or why I decided to study it. And I'm pretty sure I remember my senior year in college. I was studying Eleanor Roosevelt, her My Day column. And I came across a reference to Chautauqua because um, both her and Franklin Roosevelt had spoken at the Chautauqua at different points. And I remember thinking, what is a Chautauqua? And kind of tucked it away in the back of my mind. And later, somehow, when I was getting ready to start my PhD and was thinking about a dissertation topic, the Chautauqua floated back up to the surface. I wish I remembered exactly what prompted that to do so, but I do remember talking to one of my professors and he had mentioned that Chautauqua was often overlooked within the academic study. And I had kind of started to notice that from one of the books I'd read by one of the the scholars of the Chautauqua movement. And so that is what started me with the Chautauqua journey. And then I'd always been interested in women's history and I had taken a couple of gender history classes at KU during my master's program. And so that was what led me to focus within the Chautauqua movement itself, which covers a wide range of topics and issues to see how women specifically try to get more political activities and social reforms onto the platform and within the program. Could you explain what a Chautauqua is and the origins of the Ottawa Chautauqua in particular? Yes. So the Chautauqua actually began in Western New York State in 1874. It was started by two Methodists, and they had the intention of originally wanting to train Sunday school teachers, who at that time would have been primarily women. They drew from Methodist camp meetings, which had really been popular during that Second Great Awakening, the 1850s, 1860s, which tended to have the idea that it would be important to worship in the outdoors. Um, However, they didn't want it to be quite as a spectacle as what camp meetings had kind of become by that point. So they wanted to keep this idea of being outdoors. So they picked this place in Chautauqua County, New York, alongside Chautauqua Lake, and which is where they got the name for their assembly. And they wanted to combine this leisure experience with an educational atmosphere so that people, and at that time, again, primarily women, would have the opportunity to learn, but also have that downtime. And it was so popular that first year that it continued to become an annual event at Chautauqua, New York. But in addition to that, it actually prompted the spread of Chautauqua assemblies across the country. So Kansas was the first state west of the Mississippi River to have a Chautauqua assembly. And the first Chautauqua assembly was in 1878 in Bismarck Grove, just north of Lawrence. And what's pretty amazing is that it actually didn't do that well there. And I say it's amazing because if you know anything about Bismarck Grove, you'll know that it was a place where people gathered for temperance activities. And it was really during that late 19th century time period that became a big draw. And the Chautauqua, it seemed to have a lot of similarities for prohibition against alcohol, and it had that same kind of feel. It moved on from Bismarck Grove, it landed in Topeka for one year, didn't do well there, and so then Ottawa became the place for that Chautauqua assembly, and its first year was in 1883. There are a few reasons why Ottawa um, was 
the chosen location, it was actually, there was a, a minister in that area who really wanted the Chautauqua to start in Ottawa. He thought that there would be a lot of support from the town, which there was. There were a lot of churches in Ottawa who were really excited about having a Chautauqua assembly because the Chautauqua had this religious foundation. And sure enough, Chautauqua stayed in Ottawa for more than 30 years, and it became the longest and most successful Chautauqua assembly in Kansas. What accounts for the popularity and growth among women in Kansas to attend these types of events? One of the reasons why I also wanted to bring Chautauqua into conversation with women's political and social reforms is that the timelines are very similar, and the demographics are as well. And that is something that I have found and have really had a lot of fun with taking on the road with my Speakers Bureau presentations is showing how those two timelines, as they're kind of running alongside each other, why it's important to bring them into conversation. So during the same time period, what you see is a really amazing growth um, among women's movements. Sort of suffrage was one that was not quite as popular during this time because it was still such a radical issue for a lot of people. It took women a little too far outside of their perceived social norms of being in the home, but two other reforms movements were particularly popular, one of them being the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which got its start in 1874 and really became the largest women's um, movement in the United States during the late 19th century. And the other one was women's clubs. And both of these show up pretty regularly at the Chautauqua. And one of the reasons why I think the Chautauqua was such a great place for women particularly is because during this time period there were these expectations about women, women's roles, separate spheres, and being more in the domain of the home. But the Chautauqua had this space that kind of embodied both a private and a public atmosphere. It was a safe space where you're in the public but you're with relatively like-minded people and you knew that there would be opportunities for you to learn from others, to talk to other women. And Chautauqua's did not just have women at them. There were men and children there as well. But for women in particular, it was a place where they could go, take a little bit of a break from chores at home, learn, discuss things with each other, and then go back home and take those ideas with them. In your article, you describe women as becoming active participants in the Chautauqua movement. What activities would they participate in, and are they the same as what the men and the children would be doing at these meetings, or are those groups removed from the larger conversation that is happening? One of the things about the Chautauqua that it's such a big topic to study, and I realized as I was going out and talking with through the Speakers Bureau to a lot of different audiences, I wanted to make sure to be clear that there were all types of people at the Chautauqua and that women, men, and children were all together. And there are pictures of entire families who are camping out at the Chautauqua and that they could have all participated and listened to lectures and musical performances. But there were also gender-specific and age-specific activities. So for example, you had the Women's Council that was started at the Ottawa Chautauqua in 1892. While I'm sure they didn't turn away men from those, I think it was obviously tailored specifically towards women and that it would be topics that women wanted to discuss. And these would have been ranging anything from domestic related uh, issues to current events, to temperance, to social reforms, to suffrage. And all of those would show up on the Chautauqua programs. Men also had their own activities that they could participate in. And, but I think one of the more interesting aspects about the Chautauqua is that children had their own activities. They actually often at many of the larger assemblies, like the one in New York and even in Ottawa, they would have a boys club or a girls club. And the nice thing about this, especially for women, is that because they did not have to be the caretakers of the children during the assembly, they were free to do these other activities, which would have been to listen into a woman's council meeting, to listen to a lecture, to just sit and discuss things with other women without having to worry about taking care of their children. And that way, that intergenerational aspect was at the Chautauqua, but they also had the ability to let women participate in these things while not worrying about being that homemaker. One thing that I find fascinating is that they are often held in an outdoor space. Is there a greater meaning behind this, or is it purely for logistical reasons? That is a great question. It's interesting. I agree, because I think it's a little bit of both. The original intention of the founders was that they really wanted it 
to be in this kind of beautiful outdoor pastoral setting. And so you often see a lot of the Chautauqua assemblies are in rural or small town areas. They are intentionally not in larger urban centers. I think this was in one way trying to appeal to this idea of being out in nature, um, worshiping the sacred outdoors. That kind of language shows up within the programs and the descriptions that they were putting out at the time. But another way, I think it is a little about logistics. They would often have thousands of people show up just to hear one person speak. And in the New York Chautauqua, they built an auditorium that could seat 6,000 people. And there are different reports that show that, especially for the most popular speakers, such as William Jennings Bryan, they could have upwards of six or 7,000 people show up to hear him talk, even in a small town like Ottawa, which would have essentially doubled the size of the town. So it was probably both that logistics aspect. And what's interesting is while in New York, after the first couple of years, and they and saw how successful it was going to be, they built permanent structures for people to live in during the summer. But in a place like Ottawa, camped in tents. And so they would show up for a seven to 10 day program. And some people who came and stayed for the entire time would have camped out in a tent in July in Kansas, when we, as we know, it gets very hot and very humid. And so that would have been the way that they were um, experiencing the Chautauqua. And I always think that is just pretty amazing, the dedication that they would have had in in order to have that experience. You mentioned some prominent speakers that would be brought in due to their popularity. Are there any female speakers or leaders in this movement that stand out to you? There were several women that showed up multiple times throughout my research. And some of these is because I was intentionally looking for them. And because I chose to focus on suffrage in particular, kind of women's reforms more generally. What I saw was that Anna Howard Shaw was someone who was a big name in both the suffrage world and the Chautauqua world. Anna Howard Shaw, to me, is one of the more interesting suffragists, uh, national suffrage leaders, because she, unlike some of the others, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she did not come from a wealthy family. And so from the very beginning, she had to work to earn a living. And one of the ways that women could actually make a living during this turn of the 20th century time period is by being on the lecture circuit. So Anna Howard Shaw shows up pretty early on at Chautauqua's speaking on suffrage, and she got paid pretty well in comparison to some of the other ways that women would be paid during this time period. And so she is one that I think sort of did double duty in a sense in that she was able to spread the message of suffrage and also earn a living. In 1901, Anna Howard Shaw pops up at 20 different Chautauqua assemblies across the country. So you can imagine that's a pretty rigorous schedule to be taking the train or carriage or however you're getting from place to place in order to be speaking at all of these different assemblies. But she would have gotten paid pretty well in the process. Another woman specifically in Kansas, whose name that I saw quite a bit, was a woman named Caroline Prentice. Caroline Prentice was not someone whose name has really shown up in the record anywhere else that I have seen, but she was in charge of the Women's Council in Ottawa. What's really interesting is that when I was over in Boulder, Colorado, and I was doing research at that Chautauqua Assembly, Caroline Prentice's name showed up there as well. In fact, She was so successful in what she had done with the Women's Council in Ottawa in 1892 that when Boulder started their assembly in 1898, they invited Caroline specifically to come over and help them start their own Women's Council. A few years later, she shows up again in the New York assembly, helping run their Women's Council over there. So in that respect, what I find really fascinating is the movement that was occurring. And this is something that I think, especially with the Chautauqua, that fascinates me is this, how do we trace the movement of ideas? And you can see it with these specific women as they're showing up at different Chautauqua assemblies, like Anna Howard Shaw and Caroline Prentice. Earlier, you mentioned that the suffragist movement and its associated ideas weren't popular in the beginning of these meetings. But in 1894, there was a chance that women could gain the right to vote, and many believed that it would become realized. The fact that it didn't turn out that way, is that a limitation of this organization as a whole? Or is it more reflective of the time in which they were living? I would say it's a little of both. It, in this case, in 1894 specifically, 
that was a year that in the case, in the turn up for women's suffrage and that campaign, women just seven years earlier had had a major victory in Kansas and that they had received municipal suffrage to vote in city elections. The way they had gotten that though was not through a popular vote. They had negotiated directly with the legislature, which at that time was run a um, majority by Republicans. However, there was some concern that Democrats who had briefly taken over the governorship in the early 1880s in Kansas was going to go back on the enforcement of prohibition, which had occurred in 1881. So women used their political savvy in the 1880s to convince Republicans to grant them this right to vote within city elections, arguing that they would be able to help enforce prohibition. So they were riding that momentum into 1894, believing that they had shown that they had this great success, they were doing a good job of being good voters, and especially for the Republican allies. However, by 1894, there is this really brief little takeover by the populace within Kansas. And essentially what happens is that even though women were trying to form a nonpartisan movement of within their movement of suffrage, that they got caught up in the larger partisan politics that occurred during this time period between populists and Republicans, populists trying to hold on to their political power, Republicans trying to take it back. And so what women ended up doing is they first went to the Republicans who had a long history of allyship of them and supporting suffrage. And Republicans said, we don't have time to worry about you, essentially. So they turned to the populists next and populists agreed that they would help push women's suffrage on their platform. But by the time it got to the popular vote, it, they just did not have enough support and populists had to essentially push women's suffrage to the back burner. So women sort of got caught up in that. And it's interesting because you've got two prominent Kansas women, Laura Johns, who was a Republican, and Annie Diggs, who was a populist. And you sort of see this play out in their attempts to bridge that their own partisan divide, but it just wasn't quite enough during that 94 campaign. So there was a sense, I think, especially you see it at the Ottawa Chautauqua, which is an interesting case study, that come to the Ottawa Chautauqua, listen to suffrage leaders like Anna Howard Shaw and Susan B. Anthony, and listen to them talk and go out and campaign for the vote. But despite all of that, despite their own efforts at trying to have this unified campaign, I think they just were not able to successfully navigate those, those partisan politics. So the Chautauqua, in that sense, was limiting in that it could only do so much. It was a platform that brought a lot of people together, but it was only one means of campaigning. Chautauqua tended to pull on one particular demographic, that of the white Protestant middle class. And one of the other criticisms during that 1894 campaign towards the women uh, suffrage leaders is that they did not do a good enough job of reaching out beyond that specific demographic to the rural community, to the African-American and minority voters, to the laborers, to the, to the workers. And so because of that, they were unable and they were not successful. What do you see as the end points for the Ottawa Chautauqua? So the Ottawa Chautauqua, I had mentioned earlier, that was the longest and most successful Chautauqua assembly in Kansas. However, it did come to an end in 1914. And this actually reflected a larger trend across the country for all of these other assemblies that were called at that time independent assemblies, sort of miniature versions of the New York Chautauqua. And the reason for it is that in the early 1900s, right around 1905, there was a third iteration of the Chautauqua movement. And that was called the circuit Chautauquas. And what the circuit Chautauqua model did is it took this concept of the Chautauqua, but instead of having people travel to a permanent location like New York or Ottawa or Boulder, the circuit Chautauqua would come to them. It actually seems like there were a lot of parallels between circuit Chautauquas and the circus. There would be a big tent, there would be performances, entertainment, and in fact, a lot of people during this time period actually did not believe that the circuit Chautauquas were even actually true Chautauquas. And you can see that with some ways, I think the popularity of the name Chautauqua, people jumped on that and would call something Chautauqua that may or may not have held true to those ideals. But regardless, these circuit Chautauquas became really popular and sort of took over to the point where independent assemblies could not compete because of the way that the circuits were organized by bureaus and they couldn't afford to pay the same kind of talent that these circuit bureaus were doing. And so in 1914, the Ottawa Chautauqua comes to an end, partly because of, I believe, the circuits 
and partly because Ottawa had actually experienced some really bad flooding in recent years and to the point where they were not able to even hold an assembly during the 1910s. And during this time period, when I was looking through newspapers and, and reading about the Ottawa Chautauqua, I was struck by a really interesting contrast between the 1890s, where Ottawa Chautauqua had seemingly been kind of in the heart of all of the political activity that was going on within women's political reforms and women's suffrage. They were encouraging women to go out, to come listen to the Ottawa Chautauqua, and then go out and urge others to vote for them. They were really being active participants in the sense that they were encouraging action on the part of those who attended. By 1912, when women in Kansas were actually successful in getting the vote, it was such an interesting difference to me because even though there was still a women's council at the Ottawa Chautauqua, Ottawa was two years away from its end. And instead of having this really active language within its newspaper and within its programs telling women what they need to do in order to help get the vote, Ottawa Chautauqua by that point seemed to be a little more passive. They did have a debate on their stage, on their platform, um, between two people, one for suffrage and one against suffrage. But from the language, it seemed much more of a spectacle to the point where it almost seemed to, that Ottawa Chautauqua was on its kind of last breath and trying to reflect a little bit of what those circuits had been doing in, in the sense that they were trying to be more entertaining than educational. And so it was just interesting to me, and, and you asked earlier about kind of the effectiveness of the Chautauqua sort of in a bigger discussion of suffrage in Kansas. And I do think in 19, by 1912, 1914, you see that limit there. And it's why it's important that when I talk about the, the Chautauqua and I explain that it was just one way of campaigning. It was successful in a lot of ways, and I think it reached a lot of people, which was one of its, the biggest aspects of its success. But it also had its own limits. And you see that show up in Ottawa specifically by 1912. I'm sure our listeners, myself included, would love to hear about any future projects you are working on. Could you go into any detail about that? Yes. You know, it's been really fun for me to have finished a dissertation that focuses on women's suffrage in 2019, going into a hundred anniversary, the hundredth anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So I do think that I will be carrying this through for a little while yet uh, through the Speakers Bureau and through possibly another article just on women's suffrage in Kansas more broadly. However, one of the projects I would love to do with my current research and even expand upon it, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, is that I really see this project having a really good collaboration opportunity with a digital humanities focus. And what I see is like really mapping out some of the movement of ideas is what I'm calling it with, between Chautauqua assemblies with, within the suffrage movement. And because one of the things that can be really hard to track within the Chautauqua is who attended, who were these people? Because a lot of times this the structure of the Chautauqua, people would come visit and then they would leave and they would take that information back with them and all of the paraphernalia that goes along with the Chautauqua programs and postcards and, and different things. So you don't always know exactly who was there in the audience, but I think what you can start to see from the assemblies themselves and some of the lectures and some of the topics on their programs is you can start to track how movements were starting to spread across the country, movement of these different ideas um, and suffrage particularly. So I'm excited to, to see where that could take me and try to get a little more training in digital humanities work in order to possibly do that project. But through my research and through actually my work at the Watkins Museum, I have had the really neat opportunity of encountering a lot of different women's clubs in Lawrence. And one of the things I did not realize um, until I started working there and started talking to people about some of my work with women's social and political reforms is that there are a lot of women's clubs that were started in Lawrence in the late 19th century that are still going today. We have one club in particular, Friends and Council, who will be celebrating their 150th anniversary in 2021, which is really amazing to me. And so I think a project that I have sort of been tossing around and waiting for my dissertation to, uh, to be finished is to actually do possibly some oral histories, some research on these women's clubs and understand them more specifically within Lawrence itself and possibly even Kansas more broadly because I know Lawrence is not the only city that has these women's clubs that have been around for so many years. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell, for coming and talking with us today. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about the topics discussed on this podcast, consider becoming a subscriber to our journal, Kansas History, a journal of the Central Plains. Visit our webpage on the Kansas State University's Department of History website to learn how.